John has been creating business systems for almost 40 years uh, and providing consultancy for over 30 years. Uh, so there's not a lot of business problems he hasn't seen and not a lot of problems that he hasn't solved either. Uh, John will be speaking with us this evening on real world business automation. Ladies and gentlemen, John Silver. Hey, thanks, Steve. Uh, good evening, everyone, or good evening, Hove. Um, so, as Steve said, I'm doing this real world AI and corporation for business. That's me, been kicking around the industry for a long time, and uh, that may be a good thing, that may be a bad thing. JFDI is a company of about 10 people, we're slow growing. We, like uh, we keep everything nice and controlled, we're very, very selective about our clients, and we do all sorts of interesting things for our clients. We have a really good time doing it most of the time. We like big, bold messages, and we love big, bold colours, and um, that's about the extent of our marketing prowess. Um, we like to think we can automate everything, uh, and automating everything, what's that mean? <laughs> well, we use technology that's appropriate for the job, I suppose. We do lots of things with automation technologies, and that's not just AI and machine learning, as I'll hopefully explain to you. Can I just take a quick show of hands? Who's a technical person here? <laughs> cool. And who's a businessy or management type person? Mm. If you're sitting next to somebody who's not like you, just shake their hand and say, Hi. Because I think the techies and the business people really don't talk to each other very well at all. Um, so I'm hoping that I'll be able to uh, facilitate some of that. So what we're covering this session is this law. So understanding automation and avoiding the confusion. Here's our um, automation buzzwords in a form of a hedgehog for no reason other than I like hedgehogs. I had to put it in some sort of cloud, so I chose that. Um, that's a load of buzzwords, and they love buzzwords in this industry. So, this is my selected buzzwords. And these are the useful ones. So, these are the ones I'll cover hopefully this evening. Um, the one I won't cover is Internet of Things, because by the time you're connecting software to the physical world, that requires an entire evening of its own. So I'm not even going to touch on that one, but it's something we do. So, human versus machine, what are they good for? We know that humans are great at flexibility and abstract thinking and all of that stuff, and Machines, they're really, really good at repeatability and accuracy and stuff like that, speed, but they're rigid. But they do have low running costs, and people don't. You employ somebody, you employ another person to do a job, you have to make sure that you feed them. And with a machine, you don't. It's a one-off investment, low running costs. So how to automate a process? First of all, understand the process. Goes without saying, but a lot of people don't. Uh, very few people have much of an idea of how their business processes actually work, or even what their business processes are. Two, find the bottlenecks. These are the pinch points, the pain points, the bit that cause your staff stress or your clients anger, frustration, that sort of thing. They're the points at which, if somebody goes away on holiday, the data stops, the stops flowing around the, the organization, around the process. So find those first. Then identify the smart bits. These are often the same bits. They're the bits that require some sort of human judgment. Maybe thinking about gray areas, that sort of thing. 
and they're really, really difficult to automate. So you have to know where in the process they are. Go for the easy wins first. You'd be amazed at the number of organizations that go, right, we're going to create an entire automated process. We're going to take this entire process and automate the entire thing. And you can't. Because it's really, really expensive to do that. But what you can do is you can take the bits that cause your staff lots of stress, for example, lots of copy and paste things, and you can apply really easy automations and get big wins for very little investment. And that just speeds the entire process along. So sometimes you don't need to actually have the entire thing automated. And the last bit is engage experts. Well, I would say that with the time. Um, experts, people who've done it before, because they'll be able to tell you how to spend a budget wisely. They'll be able to tell you, especially if they've got some sort of ethics like we have, the way you think you want to automate things isn't the best way, and it's going to end up causing you lots and lots of pain and consuming all of your budget really, really quickly. So there are no silver bullets. You should ignore vendors, and you should, should ignore fanboys and fangirls and fanging people, because they'll always go on about tools. And you don't want to focus on the tools, you want to focus on the solution. There are no one-size-fits-all tools. There's nothing that you can buy off the shelf today that's going to do all of your automation. It just doesn't work like that. Generally, you're going to hook loads of stuff together, HST. We describe what we do as HST, hook shit together. <laughs> you can't just take this, a process and map one-to-one -one a person to a machine. It doesn't work like that. It's not a one-shot process. This actually applies to most software development. You need continuous improvement for reasons which I'll go over later. So processes have lots of hidden bits. It's important to realize what we automate is processes. We always automate processes. Processes have data and decision making and branching and processing. It's mostly hidden in people's heads. In most organizations, it's hidden in people's heads. It's not even written down. And replacing brains is really hard. So this leaves us with um, how do you achieve automation? It's important to realize, I know it's all about AI and machine learning and automation, but not all automation is AI. In fact, most of it isn't. But the great thing is, all automation is magic. <laughs> and it is. How many of you have installed smart home stuff at home? You know, just a few little bits and pieces and you walk into a room and the lights come on. That's fantastic. It's all magic. Or you have a little macro that you run in Excel that tra transfers all your figures from one place to another place and transforms them on the way and it saves you having to retype all of that which would have taken you about three quarters of an hour and that's magic. What appears to be AI often isn't. Um, to the user all automation is magic but intelligent can just mean matching values within tolerance range like Soundex codes for searching which have been used for decades. That's really old tech fuzzy logic, but it appears like AI, even though it's not. Much AI is actually machine learning, as we know, which is mostly computational statistics. True AI is expensive. It's things like neural networks and generative adversarial networks and stuff like that. It's all very, very advanced computer science. So does it matter that not all automation is AI? So most of the time, when we automate things, we're using APIs. An API is an application programming interface. It uh, provides controlled access to a system from outside. REST APIs are the most common because of the web, because everything's linked via the internet, and they're either secured in some way, 
or they're public. And there are many public APIs that you can access and get really useful data from. They should be treated as sort of packaged functionality. You go and get some data from somewhere that can do that data. And you don't need to know about how that, that data is produced, you just go get that data. Or you insert that data into some sort of business system, extracting or injecting. So that's the main uh, API examples. You've got uh, Applied AI and ML. Accounting and ERM. You can actually take data and place it into your account system or extract it out and use it in some sort of automated process. You can get weather for your location or any location on the globe. You can do image processing. Transport's quite interesting. You can go and get the next bus times or train times. Uh, reach planning, that sort of thing. And retail, if you need to look up the SKU of anything, Best Buy and Walmart have amazing public APIs that you can go and address and get all of that good information. So, how do we hook it all together? We use workflow stuff. Workflow software basically allows us to work with APIs, Automate data retrieval and entry, <coughs> move data, get human input or approval, escalate it when nothing happens because somebody can't be bothered or somebody went on holiday or somebody had a bad lunch time under a bus. And you can uh, employ low code or no code rules processing. So any non technical user can update the rules. Quite, quite cool and useful. So, there's some workflow tools here. At the top, I've naturally put our JFDI Bob product. Uh, it's a platform that specializes in time series data or real time data, it allows you to process that stream and do something with it. Uh, I'll give you some examples of what we do later. Um, things like Microsoft Power Automate. And at the bottom here, we've got PowerShell. It's a scripting language, basically, but it allows you to do amazing automations, and we do. So then that brings me to robotic process automation. So this is substituting for people. What it does is it automates user actions, because robots don't need to be hardware. Very useful when no APIs exist. So when you're using legacy software, which let's face it, is most of the software in operation in the world today, you don't have APIs, you don't have web interfaces. All you have is some sort of console that logs into a system and you've got to type away or do mouse clicks in order to do the thing that you do. Well, with robotic process automation, you can automate all of that. You can do intelligent OCR so that you can scrape data from screens and web pages and paper documents. And you can do a sort of macro recording thing where you get your user to sit down and do the thing that they do in their everyday life and you record that. You can't just play that back verbatim, you've actually got to put in some what happens if, I don't know, the login doesn't work, the back end server's down or something. But essentially, you can actually get the majority of that captured into a script. Some examples of RPA tools. You've got all of that good stuff, including the latest thing, which is Microsoft Power Automate UI flows, which are really cool, um, and some of the older stuff, UiPath. Uh, one of the oldest ones there is Win Automation. It's been around for 20 years, I think. And at the bottom, we've got custom code. Because, of course, we can write custom code to do all of this stuff. Sometimes that's appropriate, other times not so much. So, on to some AI stuff, how to make a machine learn. First of all, collect a data set. Remember, data is not just the data that you're trying to model, but it's also the data that gives that data context. It's stuff that happens at the same time as that data. Stuff that 
may actually allow you to spot patterns in that data and what may affect the patterns in that data. So, contextual data in the data set. Then select an algorithm, so you've got regression and all of those other ones. Build the model. Split the data, really important. You need to split the data so you can actually test the data or test the model against the data. It's a very useful programming model using all of your data and then having nothing to test it with. Because if you test it with the data you built it with, of course it's going to work. So then you test, improve and iterate. And the best way of testing is we forecast using historical data. So we can do weather modeling like this. We can actually build a weather forecasting model and then feed it historical weather data and get it to forecast what the weather was going to be two days hence or five days hence or ten days hence to test how good your forecasting model is. And then execute. And that's really the bit that most people miss out. <coughs> you ingest data and you process it and uh, against the model and then you take actions based on what the model sees. So it matches classes, it classifies stuff, or it picks out exceptions and does exception reporting, or alarms, or alerts, or whatever you want it to do. So you're generally using AI or machine learning as some sort of decision support for a workflow system or an RPA system. So some machine learning examples, things like interpreting sensor data patterns, recognizing faces, all of these. And we've done a few of these. Um, one of the most interesting ones is predicting machine failure and scheduling machine maintenance, which is something that Eric uh, touched on earlier. Um, it's one of the best uses of machine learning. And when you've got a machine that generates loads of data every day, and the data generally goes nowhere except into some sort of data recorder. Um, it's actually nice to kind of use that data and make sure that uh, you're going to predict breakdowns. Breakdowns are really expensive. Much better to actually predict them and do some scheduled machine maintenance. So, ML. These are some everyday applications only some of them, because there's loads. So I won't go into those too much. What I will do is do this. Danger! Because uh, autonomous systems can be really, really dangerous. Um, when a machine is doing th things really, really fast <coughs> and autonomously, things can go wrong really, really fast and have a huge cascade effect really quickly and cause lots and lots of damage. So you can, the kind of thing that can go wrong are things like misidentification or misclassification of a situation or a pattern. So audit trails are absolutely essential. And the best action is often referred to human, but not always, as we'll see. So when algorithms go bad, um, this is a slide I inserted last night because uh, I was just gathering some images for this presentation. And I did this, I uh, went to Adobe Stock and I searched for the word exasperated. And what I got back was this. Can anyone see what's happened here? Can anyone reverse engineer the algorithm that they've used? Because this is what I think happened. They took the search term, they looked up the synonyms, and they searched for sound alarms. So, exasperated, incensed. I give you <laughs> lots and lots of justice. 
And it was just such a gift horse, I just had to cut in an extra slide, it was just lovely. But then sometimes things go rather more badly wrong. This Uber autonomous car, or one very like it, hit and killed a woman at Elaine Herzberg uh, in March 2018. And um, that was her bike. And for anyone of a sensitive nature, look away. Because this was a case of human operator failure as well as technology failure. The technology, the LiDAR on top of the car, didn't see her crossing the road. And therefore the systems that were meant to automatically break didn't automatically break. But there was a human operator on board. That's her on the left, and that on the right is Lake Hemsburg. The operator, who was meant to be guiding this unproven piece of deadly tech through the streets, was actually streaming the voice to her phone when the accident occurred. Uh, the lady herself failed to see the car hurtling towards her, crossing a very, very busy road, a wide road. So double human failure, unfortunately, uh, led to a death. Luckily, most aren't that bad. So this is another danger. Uh, change management is chaotic by nature. What do I mean by that? Uh, it's not unique to AI projects. This is all software projects, all change management projects, everything, everywhere. Change breeds change. You can't predict what those changes are going to be. And by the second generation of changes, of consequential changes, all your guesses are going to be wrong. Every single one. So you build software to fit a process, and that then changes the process. You've got to come around and reanalyze it at some point soon, because otherwise your process is going to diverge from the original process that the software was written for. And this affects AI projects and machine learning projects as much as any other project. Unmaintained software. Uh, deployed software is at best one of these, a time capsule. If it's not maintained, it stays static, and the rest of the world moves on. There can be lots of updates to the libraries that went into writing that software, but they're not applied to that software. All of those security fixes and bug fixes, and in your massive dependency tree, and anyone who's a programmer will know about these massive dependency trees, you use somebody's software. And that then uses somebody else's software, and that then uses somebody else's software. And all of that is compiled into your deployed code. It's never going to change. And this is going to cause an enormous problem at the moment because it's turned into one of these for a whole load of people. There's a library called Request. And uh, it's a JavaScript library, and it's been used in lots of other JavaScript libraries. In fact, 4.4 million GitHub repositories use request and it's just been deprecated by the author which means it's now in maintenance mode it's not going to be updated by him it's basically anyone's guess whether it's going to be well updated or not and you should stop using it right now unfortunately it's in loads of things you don't know about and uh, it's probably deep in many many dependency trees and the developers have no idea it is a ticking time bomb. Updates can bring it all up to date. So it's really important to go and update all of that deployed software from time to time. But custom software, once deployed, is rarely updated. And where processes have changed, it's really important to reanalyze the process and actually rewrite the software. So here's the thing. This is another danger. Most companies, if you ask them this question, this will be their answer. 
They have absolutely no idea what software they use. They might have some records. Those records will likely be accounting records. They know what they've paid for, but they won't necessarily know what's deployed and what it's doing. So sometimes it's really good to actually have an audit just to see what's used and what for, what it actually does for the company, how important it is, whether there might be a better way. So these are all dangers of automation. It's an interesting one, how much it all cost, because most businesses have no idea. If you want to do an automation project, let's put a direct comparison to employing another member of staff, for example. So automation versus employment. We know that uh, UK full-time wages, minimum wage, 15,000, average salary, 35,000, according to the ONS. And that's year on year. But with software, a one-off investment of between 15 and 35,000 will actually get you software that will do more than one person's job year on year on year. Which is a really good investment. Very low running cost. So why automate? Sounds like a really, really, really risky business. Because of bigger profits, that's why. Your overheads remain the same. Your costs remain variable, but now the same. And hopefully your output goes through the roof. But all of that extra output is that big, growing, blue area of profit. So what do you do with all that profit? Well, hopefully plow it back, reinvest it, give your people a raise. Other business benefits, well, to su support a sustainability policy for a start, because sustainability is great. You can reduce consumption and save money, save with another planet, and your sustainability policy then isn't just box ticking. You can reduce staff burnout. Because staff doing really tedious stuff and under pressure day in, day out, they're going to burn out. So make them managers of a process, not processes of data. Because people are really poor processes of data. And that really loops back to a thing that Steve said about employment and automation. It turns out that since I read the book, The Mighty Micro, uh, I think by a chap called Christopher Evans, and I think it was written back in about 1978, a really old book now. Um, and it's said that so many jobs are going to be lost through this microprocess of evolution and all of that stuff. It turns out that as time has gone on and automation has increased, so has employment. Overall employment has increased as a result of automation. And it's counterintuitive, but what it means is that we actually increase economic churn. We actually increase economic throughput by using automation. And that then supports a different breed of worker. And so people migrate onto new jobs, and then some of the old people, they retire. New jobs are created, new categories of work are created. So over time, we don't lose jobs. We just lose that, hopefully. So on some client projects, these are real world automations we've done. So uh, auto tag. Uh, most documents are unstructured. They're just loads and loads of word processor text and that sort of stuff like that. What you really want to do is um, make it searchable in a structured way, not just sort of random text. You want that to happen. And then you want that to be taken and turned into document metadata, or tags. And that then enables you to um, do structured searching. So it enhances the value of documents and enables research. We've done that for a particular company to great effect. And they, their whole lifeblood depends upon the value they can extract from historical documents. Autocrop, turning disparate photos into standardized headshots. So you take a 
headshot where somebody's placed to the side with a slightly jaunty angle because photographers like that don't do that sort of thing. That would turn into an awful headshot if you just used cropping in an HTML document using CSS, that sort of thing. Awful. You'd probably end up with half a hair and no face. But we can turn it into that all through, well, it's, it's basically a bit of machine learning. You recognise the face, you draw a rectangle around the face, you expand the face, then you drop out the background. So, offset's no problem, several crops simultaneously, yay, really cool. Uh, lighting corrected, vast majority are automatically require no human intervention. Some do, but it's a tiny minority, and it saves thousands of somebody's very, very tedious hours. Why don't they just get a photographer in? We've got some very busy people. Then we've got uh, auto text. Uh, this is adding text to scan documents using OCR. You take some scanned documents, images with no text, you do OCR, you end up with a PDF with text. So this makes scan searchable, and value to the documents basically. So there are some examples of stuff we've done for clients. Stuff we do at JFDI. Eating our own dog food, as we call it. There you go. We take commercial data from Amazon and other places. And using PowerShell scripts, we import that into Zero, our accounts package. We do the same with financial data from PayPal and Stripe. And it saves us so much agonizing, annoying, really manual, tedious work for not much investment, has to be said. It's one of those easy wins. <laughs> then um, this is another thing. We do generation of web page content from databases. Quite simple, really. So this is the best stuff. This is the absolute best stuff. Uh, using Bob, we do all of this stuff. And we've turned our very modest industrial unit into a really cool future office. <laughs> the, uh, the bit at the bottom uh, is not a joke. We actually have a methane sensor in the uh, uh, <laughs> as soon as we find a, a, a methane, a methane a captain sensor, we'll uh, install that as well. Um, intelligent voice announcements are really cool and uh, monitoring a car park by, uh, by using computer vision is really cool as well. So we know when there's an interloper and we can go and have a word with them immediately. Very good for car parking spaces in Brighton. That brings me to the end. If you have been, thank you for listening. And um, if you want me, then that's how to find me and you can scan that if you want. You should have scanned it from way back there, and that gets you all my contact details. Thank you very much. Yeah, Yeah, brilliant. Right, any questions for John? That's all. I have a question actually. Uh, so, would you say automation is just for bigger businesses? So, obviously, what drives a lot of this is access to data. Bigger companies have that data. Uh, appreciate there's places you can go out and get the data from, for sure. But uh, realistically, is that data that you can get going to be relevant for a small business? Absolutely, it's going to be, yeah, completely relevant. Um, I mean, for example, a, a, a pub that's really interested in um, reducing the Drink and drive uh, occurrences of its clientele might want to just put, I don't know, a little thing by the door that just tells people when the next bus is coming. And it might actually be the one thing that makes people leave their car at home because they'll actually be able to catch the last bus back. So that's kind of an interesting observation. Um, most developers use lots and lots of automation. 
to make our lives easier. Um, I use printers, for example, to make sure I spot all the errors before it even gets to deploy. Um, it's really, really useful. Um, but any small business can actually take things like accounting data and make it a much, much nicer experience sort of um, processing that data uh, through just simple automations. Um, my good friend Jonas is back there. Um, one man business at the moment, and um, he's looking at all sorts of interesting um, automations that will enable him to keep multiple systems that he has to use in sync with each other uh, for bookings. And um, at the moment, that's a real pain in the ass. But with automation, it becomes easy and kind of joyful. So yeah, any kind of business really. Maybe was a, a, a better return for a smaller business. Absolutely, yeah. 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 And even the smallest automation is an automation. Yeah. We've done a lot of use here for our finance um, package as well. Uh, great the amount of plugins that we've been able to kind of use across that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Time reporting, we, we all of our time reporting goes directly into Zero and gets used for invoicing. So type sheets. Yeah. Okay. So that's really interesting. It's all very, very good. And uh, we've automated that through buttons that you can press to say, I'm working on so and so project now. So it makes the whole process much nicer to use than uh, the need to adopt your timesheet system and do what we do with the Yeah. You know. um, yeah, just press a button. You're working on that system now. Press a button, you stop. Zero is uh, yeah, zero is pretty critical for us because we did a bit of lab, you know, it allows us to have a little bit of automation, bring that in ourselves, and I think we see the same with Microsoft Teams, you know, being able to do some of that within the business. Any other big good packages out there that is worth um, investing in, future proofing yourself? There's a lot of hearing you know, all the time, and it, it's just really, I mean, one of the big problems is, is keeping abreast of everything that's out there that you might want to use. Um, the thing is, keep talking to people because other people will have found stuff that, that they find useful and you might find that useful too. So I think that's a, a really good use of, you know, we, techies, you tend to be quite insular and we tend to just sort of program not talk to people. And sometimes it's really, really useful to actually just go out and talk to people. Um, through Mike at the back there, um, our business development guy. Hi, hi. Um, he's actually introduced me to more people than I've met in the last probably 10 years um, because he goes and talks to people. Um, we actually get to learn stuff from them, which is really, really cool. So, um, yeah, let other people do your research for you. Okay, that's interesting. <laughs> <laughs> right, anyone else? Yeah. I have questions back there in the chat. Yeah. Wouldn't you say RPA is a suitable substitute for APIs? And if you think it's not, what routes might you take to make sure that a company doesn't shortcut building APIs by using RPA? Oh, it, to make sure RPA is only an interim solution rather than the solution. Was my disdain for RPA that evident? Um, no, it, it's very useful. It's a very, very useful tool. But at the end of the day, it is just doing some automation of keyboard presses and mouse operations, and that is no substitute for something really controlled going on on the back end in the cloud um, with decent security around it and all that stuff. So, um, yeah, it's a stopgap. But the thing is, and here's the thing, um, if we cut to the, the Internet of Things and the smart buildings sort of sector for a moment, there's lots and lots of companies doing stuff that you can fit into new build. But new build is less than 1% of all of the buildings out there. So why are you catering for the tiny minority? You need to be catering for the big majority with retrofit stuff. So, in a way, that's what RPA is doing. It's catering for the metro thing. Um, and if you don't have an API, then yeah, great. But yes, you should never take it as an, an encouragement not to write a decent API for something. Um, an API is difficult to write and probably the thing that we do first, actually, when we're doing anything. In fact, some of our APIs we actually sell as just APIs. 
Um, we've got a few of them, uh, like G images, or J images, uh, which does some image processing. Um, we have a customer in California that loves that, or Ohio, or somewhere. Um, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Well, I'll take the business perspective again. And uh, so, so, one of the things that can be a danger with developers is they assume that the process which is there is a good one. Yep. And every process is, by definition, a compromise. Yep. And so, what should be done is actually looking at what the process is there to try and solve in terms of objective. I mean, someone earlier talked about that whole thing being able to walk into a room and the lights come on the back. If you could design it as a process, you'd have a system which would have a, a robot looking at someone entering the room and a hand coming up the robot arm and switch to that. Whereas opposed to having objective, which I want the light to go on once someone comes in the room, yes. you would test it differently. So there, there is a danger, I've seen it so many times, that someone tries to automate a process without ever going back and saying, well, why are you doing it first? You have to reanalyze. And it, it's one of the first things we actually come across when we go into uh, new companies as consultants. Um, we'll ask, why do you do it in this way? And the answer will often be, well, it's how we've always done it. Um, and you'll find, digging deeper, that how we've always done it was defined by Paul, who was at the company 20 years ago and left 15 years ago. And he just decided that it should be done that way. And it's been done like that ever since. Because why are we thinking? Um, but sometimes, yeah, actually uh, going back and reanalyzing the actual business process is the really important thing to do. And it's the bit that gets me out. Yeah, don't automate an uh, absolute dog of a process. <coughs> would you um, would you reassess the process before you start any inspection? Absolutely. Yeah. 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 And um, you know, the value it has to the business, and can it be done differently? Uh, can it be cut out completely? Um, sometimes you can. Sometimes things can be just circumvented. Um, you know, the, the report that lands in somebody's mailbox every morning, does it get read? Do they do anything with it? Do we need that? So, you know, it's really important to, to, to get to the bottom of, of why these things happen. Yeah. And the business benefit of each stage. Have we got the difficulty, sorry, some of the larger companies that it's always been that way, that hasn't changed. Yeah. And reassessing it means setting up workshops with all the spots and stakeholders, and they can't be asked to do that. It's expensive. Yeah. It's an expensive process, and some people just can't be bothered. Um, we come across this all the time, you know, make sure all the stakeholders are there. Well, where are the stakeholders? And actually, engage there. Yeah. Um, it's really difficult, you know, but um, actually going and talking to them directly about, you know, what this change that has been planned is all about, that's sometimes the best approach. Yeah. Um, you know, but <laughs> where do you begin? Uh, sometimes we end up with a, a really sort of open uh, invitation, which is just, you know, come in and tell us what's wrong. We, we go in and we look for the most miserable person or the most mouthiest person. Basically, the person who has an axe to grind. Um, they're the person that you want to talk to first, really. Yeah. Um, and you can cut through the bullshit and you can actually um, hopefully get to the crux of what the problems are, yeah. where the pain points are, where the pinch points are, yeah. where the data stops flowing. Uh, <laughs> sometimes it's stuff that just falls, falls between stools. A customer will come along who is lying somewhere in that little pile on the floor. Hi, did you forget me? What, what's happening with my problem? Um, you should never have that sort of thing happen within an organisation. When it does, it causes stress. You want to fight that stress. For, for the sponsors, sorry, for, for, for re the sponsors and the stakeholders, can you provide them with a, a short sprint within a period of time? Very yeah, short absolutely. Time, something in that sort. You know, work with us on a workshop for a day to find the truth of this process, actually come out with an idea of some requirements that they can either act upon now or sometime in the future. Um, so we have workshop customers, we have sort of uh, multi-day workshop customers, we have small projects where we uh, go in and we try and pull out the, uh, the requirements from all of the stakeholders. Um, 
really difficult to get them together sometimes, but you know, we use online tools for that as well. Right, cool, fantastic. Anyone else? Yes. Hey John, you mentioned you've come here at the skeptical stance. And yeah. Just like you've used this, uh, I invest in twice in the yeah, And we just shipped out to the States entirely because we just couldn't get personal in the UK. And the analysis was interesting. And there has been this sort of wave of what I call the theater of ethics. And there's, there's always somebody in the room who has a view on ethics and AI and it's the border for the sale. And we just sort of gave up really in the UK, but I just wonder if that, you know, that phenomenon, which I've also heard in my own, maybe killing what we may be the golden goose here, you know, all these good things are I saw, I've seen it in third place myself, and we literally not one customer here, and we actually got caught by it. The Americans are usually on the issue. Do you think that's a danger? Yeah, it can be a danger. Um, we, 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 we just vehement about some things. Some things we just have to accept. The customer's not going to listen. But we'll, we keep on banging, banging on about it. Um, we generally bang on about stuff that's going to be to the customer's long term benefit or detriment. Um, so we, we just try not to allow things to happen that are going to be to the customer's long-term detriment. It's a very good example. Is, um, you know, if, if that customer has a, a sustainability or a corporate social responsibility policy and they're acting against it, we point it out. We make sure that they, they kind of, we, we almost like the digital voice on their shoulder that's constantly banging on about this stuff, um, rolling out Microsoft Teams, that's another thing. Uh, it requires governance. Rolling out Microsoft SharePoint it requires governance. It requires somebody who's actually going to step in and um, manage all of this, this sort of proliferation of data gathering. Um, and we will keep banging on about it. It will be a total pain in the arse about it. Because it's to the <laughs> best interests of the customer. Um, so yeah, the same applies to AI and NR. Um, sometimes people want to make people redundant. Don't do that. Don't do it because you want to make people redundant. Um, so we're that sort of ethical. Um, we will always try and speak up for what is best for the company in the long term. Not the short term, not, not, not the shareholders right now, not their next dividend, you know, um, but what is actually to, to the long-term benefit of the customer, despite themselves. And, um, yeah, we have to be very, very selective about customer customers, as I say. Um, we deserve to like to sack customers. That's why we're slow growing. <laughs> right, okay, I think we've kept it for a bit longer than we should do, so I'm going to call it there, but John will be sticking around afterwards, and uh, you'll be uh, free to chat. Well, thanks again, John.